I apologize for the uh, issues in getting the webinar going, uh, but uh, we we seem to be uh, we seem to have everybody in now. So uh, we were going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to what's the 15th of the SDR forum or the Wireless Innovation Forums uh, webinar series. Um, I'll do a few administrative remarks and then I'll turn it over to our speakers to walk you through today's material. So first, the slides that are going to be presented today uh, will be posted later today online. Uh, go to wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars and you'll be able to find them there. Uh, if you have any problems at all, please email me directly at lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org. A little bit about your controls. The, uh, the interface that you have has a number of features on it, and I just want to walk you through them real quickly um, so that you, uh, you, you know what you need to do if you're going to ask questions. Uh, first and foremost, you can minimize the control screen simply by clicking the little arrow that's available uh, on the screen, and that allows you to get that out of your way. Uh, the audio, hopefully everybody's connected. You can either use your mic or speakers. and um, or you can uh, use a telephone connection. Uh, there are multiple international numbers that have been set up. So if you're not seeing a number for your country, there should be a, a click button that allows you to, to look at that. Uh, make sure you put in your audio pin. Uh, that allows us to mute and unmute your phone if you want to ask a question. Uh, there's two ways to ask questions, and the speakers today have asked that you ask the questions as we go to keep things uh, so that the, the context is maintained. Uh, the first way is you can ask a question by typing it into your screen. If you uh, type it into your screen, I'll see the question, and then I'll raise it to the, uh, to the, the speaker, and they can, they can answer that way. The other way is there's a little hand button on your control interface. If you click that, it's, it's essentially like raising your hand, and then what I can do is I can call on you, unmute your, unmute your microphone, and then you can ask a question that way. Uh, so that's it for the introduction. If you have additional questions on the controls, feel free to just type a question into your question box, and I'll, I'll respond that way. Uh, and then today's agenda is we're going to go over the SCA 4.1 value proposition, and that'll be presented by Eric Nicolay from Talis. We're going to do an overview of the SCA 4.1 changes, and that'll be done by Kevin Richardson from MITRE, and Kevin's the JTNC SCA 4.1 project lead. And finally, we're going to go through how to submit a comment or issue uh, on SCA 4.1 draft, and that'll be presented by Ken Dingman of Harris. So with that, I'll turn it over to Eric, and uh, he'll run you through the first part of the briefing. Eric? We seem to have lost Eric. Um, Ken, do you want to? Uh, can you uh, do the first part of the presentation while uh, while we try and find Eric? Um, I try, although I'll admit I haven't seen the slides yet. I haven't looked at them. Um, but yeah, as we try to get Eric back, I will try to take over from here. Okay. Um, so what we're going to be talking about here. Um, there are really some of the, the benefits that are brought into the SCA from the changes that are made in, in the 4.1 um, draft that is currently out for review. So you want to go to the next? Okay, so, um, <coughs> so from 
you know, what is what have really been um, the, the purpose of DSCA um, and what has been driving the software-defined radio adoption. Um, the ground, the framework, the ground rules, the, the principle that we're trying to, to accomplish right from the very beginning has always been to enhance the communications interoperability, um, provide a better mechanism for uh, warfighters to be able to interop with each other regardless of vendor platforms or anything of that nature um, through, uh, through common waveforms and, and, um, and thereby enhancing the ability to have common waveforms is the ability to uh, host those on a common platform to, to make it simpler to move those between different, uh, different platforms. So from an uh, adoption of the SCA perspective, um, you know, has it has been shown on a number of by a number of different vendors who have implemented the SCA, um, both in the DoD market and the international market, that there are are definitely cost and delivery time advantages. Um, it supplies a much higher ability to um, reuse <coughs> waveform applications um, within a family of radios, in particular, but even across uh, vendor radios, different vendor radios. So, if you were to have a um, you know, if there's a particular vendor who has a family of SCA-based radios, the migration of, of waveforms between those different radio platforms for that singular vendor is much improved um, by utilizing the SCA across all of those different platforms. Um, <clears throat> but also, when you're talking about vendor to vendor, and you're using the concept of the JTNC IR, for instance, information repository, where one vendor develops a waveform, puts it in the information repository, Another vendor takes it out of the information repository and puts it on their SCA-based um, platform. Um, that, is also, that also is a much quicker way and a much more effective way to get that waveform onto that, that second platform than developing it from scratch. Um, and along with the time to market, well, and along with the you know efficiency, um, that helps reduce the development risk. So you don't have to reinvent um, as much new domain knowledge for the new waveforms. You're using a waveform that is rung out and working, um, so it really reduces the risk that is associated with um, the waveform development, and it improves the time to market, getting, getting those waveforms uh, completed and functional and ready to use by the warfighter in a, in a um, much shorter period of time. Next slide. So um, where do we stand <clears throat> in terms of the proliferation of the SCA within the worldwide market? Um, really, there's been a couple of generations of radios already that have been developed that are based on the SCA. Uh, the first generation focused pretty much on the narrowband um, capabilities, uh, narrowband waveform capabilities, so your line of sight capabilities in particular, um, hopping waveforms, um, things of that nature. And really, those are were driven by um, the ANPRC-152 from Harris and the ANPRC-148 from Talos. Those are the, really the main two um, radios that were in that family um, in that first generation of products. Um, second generation really started adding in some of the wideband capabilities. And these radios are also, you, you saw the numbers on the first one, a significant number of first generation radios and the number of second generation radios is also increasing very rapidly. And from the perspective of, you know, where are they coming from, you have a couple of program of record radios and, a, and also some other um, radios developed by Harris um, that are focused on networking and supporting networking applications. So these are the applications such as W&W &W and SRW um, and MUOS coming up as it gets released and proprietary um, waveforms that are developed by vendors also um, for these different applications. So how many, you know, there have been a really significant number of waveforms that have been developed and delivered on um, SDR platforms, on SCA platforms in particular. So if you're to take a survey of the inter whole international market and all of the radios that have been released, um, it's probably it's close to 40 different waveforms that have been developed and released on SCA-based platforms. Um, and many of those have been deployed um, and are being actively used by the services around the world. So 
quite a bit of success in that in that area. Um, and if you talk about the number of different platforms that are supporting the SCA, it's also a very large number. Um, you know, somewhere in the range of 40 platforms by both the U.S. and the international markets um, have are supporting or utilizing the SCA um, in in being successful with it. And those 40 platforms really range across around 15 different vendors who are have, are developing and deploying SCA-based products. <coughs> Next slide. Ken, I believe Eric is back. Do you want to hand back over to him? I will gladly hand back over to him. Okay. Eric, are you there? He appears to be muted. Let me unmute him. Eric, can you hear you me now? Yes, we can. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, so sorry, I screwed up between the French number, the US number, or whatsoever. Uh, but uh, you, you can testify. Uh, I was there before uh, before we had to drop and relaunch the, the webinar. Anyway, um, so we are on slide number eight. Yes. We just went over slide number eight. Yeah. I guess. You could move on to slide nine. Yep. Okay. So this slide nine exposes how uh, rich and uh, uh, is the ecosystem related to uh, to SCA, as we as we know. It keeps going on, and uh, the evolution dimension of the uh, of this ecosystem is not visible, of course, on, on this slide. But it's quite static. But uh, we have an increasingly uh, rich uh, breadth of uh, U.S., uh, Europe, and uh, uh, overseas uh, stakeholders uh, taking advantage of the uh, of the SCA technology, as uh, depicted in this slide. We can uh, underline as well that there are a number of Industries, of course, a number of uh, government research labs or government customers. In the end, we have as well a number of academics and uh, research labs. Uh, so, uh, really, the uh, SCA technology is uh, is largely used now uh, by a, a, a very large breadth of, of users. And part of the movement to 4.1 uh, had to do with the uh, the need to leverage the experience gathered by a number of those. Uh, folks uh, in moving forward the uh, existing triple to uh, and making a good uh, 4.1 next one please so uh, this part of the presentation will uh, will share with you a number of overview and benefits as uh, identified by the uh, advocacy work group of the SCA at the WINF so slide 11 is starting that So the first uh, thing to, to, to keep in mind is that, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, SCA 4.1 leverages the success of Triple Two, uh, that's largely deployed and used in U.S. and international markets. Uh, it incorporates new technology advances to enhance waveform interoperability, waveform portability, information assurance, and affordability. Um, so, uh, and, and part of the uh, interest in 4.1 is that it preserves, as we will uh, detail, investments done in uh, triple two waveform applications, uh, while at the same time uh, introducing some uh, key benefits uh, for uh, stakeholders uh, throughout the complete value chain. Slide 12 is drilling a little bit more into the details. Uh, with six uh, highlighted features. Uh, first uh, feature uh, dubbed here support a wide variety of SDR platform types uh, has to do with the fact the SCA can now size to the degree of reconfigurability, the uh, degree of, uh, of swap constraint uh, uh, characteristics of your, of your platform. So uh, better applicability for dismounting and lower cost will use is quite an interesting feature, uh, enabling uh, for uh, battery-powered stuff, uh, longer battery lives. Uh, it improves the architectural scalability to address the size, weight, and power uh, and cost requirements, uh, thanks to profiling uh, approach and architecture improvements. 
and it is increasing the support for devices, processing devices such as DSPs and FPGAs, uh, which were uh, until 4.1 uh, over the edge of what uh, Tripod 2 was uh, correctly addressing. Now we start to have some uh, significant coverage of uh, those kind of technologies. Point two uh, in uh, information assurance has to do with uh, a number of uh, interesting features of the spec that uh, enables, there are two ways to say that, enables to uh, make safer things uh, for cheaper or enable to make uh, attacks be more expensive. At the end of the day, those are two ways to describe some uh, improvements in the information assurance. Um, point three, performance improvements has to do with uh, operational value uh, uh, delivered uh, thanks to uh, startup time enhancements in boot and uh, away from the deployment, deployment sorry, uh, and I'd say especially in boot, uh, and improved real-time performance is as well, is as well uh, at hand in uh, natively using, as we will see, uh, the connectivity that may be available uh, over a given, uh, a given platform. Uh, reduce development lifecycle cost is point four has to do with uh, uh, alleviating the uh, test uh, the test pain uh, uh, in uh, therefore uh, reducing the testing costs uh, and uh, there's been quite an, it's difficult to quantify but those making software know that the less requirements you have the less costly it is at the end and there's been some cleanup in the in the bunch of requirements attached to the uh, to this tech that should uh, over the lifetime uh, of the uh, the development uh, significantly reduce the, uh, Hello? You're back. Hello, I'm back normally. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I, I was dropped for some reasons. So uh, I was commenting on the reduce uh, development life cycle costs. So Ken, before I go ahead, can you confirm uh, everyone can hear me? I can hear you. Okay. So, um, yeah, requirement cleanup uh, uh, has been realized as well. Uh, way from portability enhancement is the point five of this report. So here it has to do with a number of new features or technology, and it has to do with the expansion of the of the range, uh, covering range in terms of processing units towards DSPs and FPGAs. It has as well to do with the adoption of a PIM PISM approach. So uh, platform independent modeling versus platform specific modeling coming from the the OMG. Uh, that's uh, those are things that are ten years old. Uh, let's say I these are approaches, but now they are embedded into the core of the, of the specification. Um, and uh, point six, uh, easy introduction with backwards compatibility features. Uh, that's the, the, the point that was already mentioned, that uh, investment protections for what was developed under Triple 2 uh, uh, is now achieved uh, thanks to the job done uh, in defining uh, the backwards compatibility uh, unit of functionality that would enable uh, 4.1 uh, frameworks or uh, OEs uh, willing to have the backwards compatibility to uh, host uh, without any change uh, existing triple two away from applications and that's quite a positive and uh, and called for uh, feature uh, that will uh, 
significantly uh, facilitate a migration plan and roadmaps from uh, triple two to 4.1 baselines. So at the end of the day, the 4.1 provides uh, real benefits to the, the war fighters, those using the thing. That's the boot up, st boot start time story, for instance, the rate of end and the complete SDR ecosystem, so we're talking ecosystem, the question of life cycle costs and portability enhancements are, are clearly at hand. So this in a nutshell uh, is what slides, uh, slide 12 says concerning the highlights. We may move to, to the next one. So uh, some detail concerning the benefits for, for the SDR value chain, mapping the kind of stuff we've seen towards these uh, value chain, summarized here with uh, four, four uh, columns, the, the end users, the procurement, the SDR vendors, and the ecosystem. Uh, as far as end users uh, is concerned, so this uh, easier interrupt, uh, the support of a wide variety of, of platform chimes uh, will enable uh, and users to benefit for uh, SDR reconfiguration capability on uh, even broader range uh, of platform types. Uh, information assurance improvements are of course beneficial, and the performance uh, startup kind of stuff uh, is uh, is quite uh, helpful as well at the uh, end user experience level. Now concerning the procurement, the key word is way from portability and the affordability it can bring in order to reach some interoperable solutions, uh, the diversity and flexibility in procurement options, uh, because the, uh, the, the 4.1 is increasing the ability to have uh, way from to develop according to, uh, to the 4.1 being able to, uh, to run on environments being uh, delivered and developed by uh, other parties and the way from providers and, uh, and vice versa, of course. So it will uh, open up the, uh, the ecosystem in enabling for uh, easier teamings uh, and therefore uh, opening uh, for some new procurement uh, models. And uh, the world is the our marketplace is therefore uh, about to benefit for those uh, improvements. Now, uh, as far as SDR vendors uh, are concerned, the reduction in the development life cycle or the improvement in the development and testing uh, life cycles is quite beneficial as well. The portability is back there uh, again, of course, and uh, the time to market uh, with these, uh, especially this easier testing, etc., will facilitate non-regression uh, rounds and things like that. And so at the end of the day, uh, this should certainly help uh, meeting better time to market uh, requirements. And uh, as far as the ecosystem is uh, is concerned, uh, the larger application of this standard has to do with as well uh, going beyond the, the the traditional boundaries of the uh, of the SCA, which uh, as far as triple two is concerned, were already a little bit. Uh, went uh, went beyond with some usage uh, reported beyond the tactical radio uh, domain, uh, let's say. Uh, but folks developing that and back to uh, taking into account a number of comments from non-tactical radio folks uh, make us strongly believe that there is a big potential for the 4.1 to to move beyond the uh, its initial uh, tactical radio uh, ecosystem or defense uh, SDR ecosystem. We may move to the next slide. Um, we had uh, a number of testimonials that were delivered during the SCA 4.1 preview event that uh, uh, WINEF uh, held on the 9 and 10 of October uh, near Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland, uh, hosted by Mitre Corporation in cooperation with JetNEC. This uh, one day and a half event uh, had a two-hour session, something like that, where a number of stakeholders were invited is to express concerning what they think uh, regarding the emerging 4.1. Of course, the draft was not there at that time, but thanks to the international collaboration model between the JetNEC and the international community and the wire through the wireless, wireless innovation forum, sorry, uh, we had uh, over the world development quite regular and accurate report from uh, 4.1 developers uh, from JetNEC. Uh, that enabled uh, those who followed that to have a quite uh, accurate uh, vision of what the SCA 4.1 would look like. And, uh, and typically now we have the draft, the early reports confirm that the draft has some differences with what was 
uh, presented and known at the moment of the preview, but uh, what was said at that moment is not changed, but the kind of stuff we are seeing now as small differences in the draft. So what did the people say? Uh, so uh, things are uh, sorted in uh, alphabetical order there. So let's start we are with Aeroflex uh, saying 4.1 is not just for tactical radio. A quite interesting statement for a company which uh, that makes uh, test and measurement equipments. So uh, already a stakeholder is quite active. That is uh, uh, beyond uh, the boundaries of the uh, uh, of the initial uh, SEA market. Uh, second quote from the French uh, procurement agency, the DGA, uh, saying that uh, DGA is investigating the potential for SCA 4.1 for its French SDR roadmap. Then we have the uh, SOR program directorate. Uh, and here the quote says that this uh, SOR community, so a group of six uh, European nations, congratulates the joint multinational effort performed in the framework of the WINFSCA 4.1 work groups. So the groups uh, who supported uh, uh, the, um, the elaboration of uh, 4.1, uh, integrating positively significant contributions provided by, uh, by SOR. Uh, then we have the quote from the Fraunhofer FKIE Institute in Germany uh, saying that the new SCA 4.1 provides a crucial edge uh, over SCA triple two. Uh, now, uh, then we have the, the, the first radio manufacturer quote from a Harris Corporation. Uh, SCA 4.1 will be a usable spec. Uh, and uh, second quote, interesting quote, SCA 4.1 is essential for broad commercial adoption. Uh, the next quote is from Nordiasoft uh, saying, uh, so Nordiasoft uh, 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 core framework and tools uh, provider uh, derived from the uh, earlier CRC activities in Canada saying that Nordiasoft has uh, already implemented many features that are now present in the uh, SCA 4.1. Uh, then a quote from uh, uh, Prism Tech uh, as well an urban tools uh, vendor uh, stating that uh, Prism Tech anticipates that uh, SCA 4.1 enhancements will help to accelerate the adoption of SCA going forward. Um, another vendor, uh, two vendors, Reservoir Labs, uh, specialized in uh, automated testing, saying that uh, Reservoir uh, anticipates continuing to support the evolution with the, of the SCA with an upgrade of uh, RCheck SCA for SCA 4.1 in 2015. So those are signs of adoption of the technology by, by, by vendors. Uh, and uh, we have a quote from Celex. Uh, stating that 4.1 includes essential features which maximize investments and ease maintenance, allowing for a smooth transition towards the next SCA implementations and for a wider spread of these technology on commercial products. And then the uh, last one from TELUS. TELUS is highly interested by SCA 4.1 and has actively contributed to its development. TELUS is positive regarding adoption of SCA 4.1 core spec. Um, I'd like to report uh, something here. I am detecting that for some reasons one quote and one testimonial uh, was scratched in preparing that. Uh, we had as well expressions from uh, Raytheon Corporation. And I guess before delivering the slides, we will be able to, to correct that. And uh, uh, as far as I remember, uh, the quote from Raytheon Corporation was uh, quite encouraging as well. And the, the thing to notice about the message from Raytheon was uh, several mentions regarding uh, usage of SCA for beyond communication things, such as electronic warfare, for instance. So that's what we have in terms of uh, testimonials. What's, that's what we had back in October. And, uh, and uh, all the participants went out from that saying that, hey, this looks quite encouraging, and it seems to be quite a lot of support concerning this emerging technology. Um, so we could go to, to the next one, slide 15. So uh, still on the overview and benefits, this section is now, if we go to slide 16, uh, drilling into 
the six points we uh, we identified before. Uh, with uh, more or less details depending on the on the points. The first one is quite detailed with three slides, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, elaborating on the possibility to accommodate uh, reduced sized, uh, reduced uh, radio size and cost. Um, that's the idea of uh, profiles, especially profiles regarding the SCA core capability, that is to say the deployment and configuration of waveforms. Three profiles have been identified there, uh, the so-called lightweight, medium, and full. The full uh, is basically corresponding to what the triple two uh, was able to do, but the triple two was forcing everybody to do that. So you like it or you, uh, or you don't use uh, triple two. The new thing is that thanks to the medium and lightweight, you may have some platforms uh, that will uh, exhibit a lightweight or medium compliance without uh, having to embrace all the capabilities that the uh, full profile slash triple two was uh, requesting. So commanding a little bit more, the lightweight is for weighted platforms where the hardware modules have a static configuration. So here we don't have this possibility to, uh, to dynamically change things post-factory, but that's uh, quite uh, realistic for uh, strongly uh, resource-constrained capability. So that's a minimum set of functionality. And for the most scrap-constrained platform, that could be quite a reasonable choice. The medium profiles, uh, uh, the medium profile, sorry, is there for platforms with plug and play but uh, not removable uh, hardware module. So it's rather lightweight, but it introduces a configurable uh, dynamic aspect. Uh, the most flexible platform in that, it provides the lightest weight implementation that supports the legacy SCA deployment model, whereas the lightweight it, it is breaking a couple of things regarding to that. But that's the price to pay to have the, the most reduced uh, footprint uh, and uh, the highest uh, runtime efficiency. And the full is for radio platforms with removable plug-and-play hardware modules. So that provides us already, say, the full breadth of what uh, SCA is able to do in terms of deployment and management. Uh, and it's aligned to support prime power or multi-channel sets. So uh, the one first advantage is that the deployment infrastructure can be tailored thanks to those provide to the needs of the, uh, of the platform you are, you are aiming for. The next one is still uh, relating to uh, to this point uh, one, uh, reducing the rate of size and cost. So the first point underlined there, component scalability, uh, allows the component developers. So by component developer, it can be the component of uh, devices uh, within a given OE. So all components of uh, uh, away from applications or SDR applications uh, themselves, the software components. So the component scalability at the end of the day enables developer to choose uh, what to pick from of the standard subcomponent interface. This component scalability uh, is, uh, is used to support the different profiles of the, of the specification. So what it means is that typically you have in the current SCA this famous resource interface with seven operations attached. Start, stop, configure, query, initialize, run test, uh, release object, if I'm correct. Uh, the typical example is that among those breadth of seven, not all of the components may need to support all of them. And uh, so this component scalability uh, is, is a pretty nice pattern in the sense that now you only implement in your component uh, the, uh, the functions that are really meaningful for your uh, component. Uh, so that can save some, uh, uh, some footprint, uh, and that's uh, globally speaking acclaimed as being something uh, much better in terms of, of quality of the software design, uh, generally speaking, because that's uh, generally quite poor to force implementation of functions that would return void uh, in case there is nothing behind. Here, uh, developers will have the capability to directly declare what they implement without declaring things that they would not uh, implement. So that's what uh, concerns component scalability. Scalability, sorry, scalability of the manager components uh, is, uh, is quite, uh, quite the same 
uh, kind of concept but related to the management component uh, themselves, uh, such as the domain manager, the device manager, uh, this kind of stuff, which can now as well be tailored depending to the uh, to a number of specific choices uh, that the uh, the provider would like to do. For instance, we could imagine those saying, "Okay, I don't want to embed uh, too massive uh, built-in tests in my in my framework, so a number of my components would not run the uh, run test interface." Uh, that's what scalability of the manager components could, could allow. Uh, third point, uh, minimal ultra lightweight AEP definition. Uh, so uh, this enables, seen from the platform side, to uh, not over constrain the platform developer uh, in uh, providing uh, ultra lightweight or lightweight uh, AEP uh, for uh, resource constrained processes such as DSPs or uh, tightly constrained GPPs. So thanks to that, uh, there is the need to, to avoid uh, um, uh, sucking memory uh, and program memory with, uh, with functions that are uh, not deemed to be essential by uh, uh, when analyzing uh, the, the balance between what are the application needs in those processes and uh, what are the, the memory capabilities of such processes. Um, and the fourth one, uh, remove requirement for core middleware. Uh, it uh, enables uh, to uh, to use. Uh, so, some comment on that. Uh, the remove requirement means that Corba is not mandatory, but Corba remains, of course, a possibility. And the 4.1. There is a typo there. We need to correct from 4.0 to 4.1. But 4.1 permits uh, other middleware uh, than Corba to be used, or other uh, row connectivity, as described in the appendix on the, uh, on the PIM to PISM transition, to be used. For instance, uh, using native C++ pointers when distributed processing is not required can be definitely used. So it, it really opens up. To, you know, to optimize the balance of the degree of flexibility brought in by your platform choices. And if you want to keep a high level of flexibility, you can keep uh, using uh, Corba technology typically, but you can use other, and you can uh, definitely um, propose platforms where uh, the degree of integration between your tools and the connectivity is not as good as what a uh, Corba integrated solution enables, but in doing that at the price of some uh, additional uh, porting uh, effort, uh, you can uh, you can substantially uh, minimize uh, the uh, the amount of uh, uh, of resources uh, taken for your uh, for your platform to be conformant. So at the end of the day, those four examples uh, uh, complete what was on the previous slide to, uh, to underline this message that the vendors are now much more flexibility to, uh, to right size uh, their radio to, to the mission and to the, uh, to the breadth of, uh, of SDR applications that their radios uh, have to ask. The next slide. Still on that is drilling a little bit on component scalability. It's explaining what took place uh, specifically in elaborating the, uh, in finalizing the 4.1, especially compared to the interim 4.0. Uh, so on the component scalability, this concept was there uh, on 4.0, but 4.1 revisited it uh, in order to make it, uh, let's say, uh, accepted and correct from a software uh, design perspective, uh, with this uh, replacement of the concept of conditional inheritance by uh, optional composition. Uh, actually, uh, some comments will take place on the draft drafts uh, on that, but uh, what is sure is that uh, we now have, uh, beyond the, what we the way we should name the solution. Uh, what is true is that we have a solution that works and that is not contested anymore by whoever uh, on the place. Uh, and uh, it allows uh, a mixture of components with different level of scalability in the same radio, which is uh, beneficial as well. That's the application mixture kind of stuff. Um, that's for component scalability. 
the specification of lightweight and ultra lightweight AEPs, which are actually uh, a win of spec that has been largely endorsed uh, in uh, elaborating the 4.1 lightweight and ultra lightweight AEPs, uh, is um, was uh, was one of the additions uh, of, of 4.1 compared to 4.0, and here we have uh, in elaborating the 4.1 really uh, something that improved uh, the the TRL by uh, by one digit compared to what was available in 4.0. In 4 uh, and uh, that's quite useful for our most resource constrained processes and certainly more acceptable uh, for a number of such resource constrained processes compared to the previous situation where the full uh, profile had to be there in case you, uh, you wanted to, uh, to claim conformance. Uh, along those lines, there is a better enforcement of POSIX conformance for those lightweight and ultra lightweight kind of stuff. Uh, so I guess that's concluding uh, what can be said regarding the resource constraint processes uh, and we can now move to the second uh, highlight, enhanced information assurance. So you have on this picture on the uh, top right uh, picture, you have this concept of uh, the triple two model where the domain manager has to request data first and each way from component uh, is, uh, um, is uh, delivering uh, information on, uh, on request. You have on the triple two, uh, sorry, on the 4.1, uh, you have uh, this registration model that has been changed and now the way from component is uh, sending information to the domain manager and only it. And it is not, uh, and it's not possible for some uh, for some uh, external object or uh, um, uh, bad object or spy object to to query the components in order to get valuable information anymore. And uh, uh, this is some sort of uh, one of the information assurance improvements. Uh, we can uh, we can see, uh, and uh, you have on the left hand side a number of uh, uh, of clauses uh, capturing that. In general, design patterns and strategies are, uh, that incorporate security awareness have been applied, and what you see on the right hand side has to do with that. Uh, this removes the ability for a component to query information that could be inappropriately used. Uh, the possibility of clients requesting information they should not have is removed by using this push model. Uh, and it's uh, order to get an object reference uh, to the domain manager and learn about the system. And uh, another interesting feature is that the naming service has been removed. Typically, uh, we don't have text supporting that on the slide deck, but uh, <coughs> it's quite... Uh, uh, shared, I would say, that the naming service of the triple two was uh, the privileged target for any uh, uh, for any uh, attacker, and therefore uh, it was the thing to protect. And this was uh, reasonably costly in terms of authentication mechanisms, uh, additional kind of stuff that was there to specifically protect the naming service. A suppression of the naming service per se is now a diluting uh, things in a much more uh, secure way uh, without having to concentrate uh, efforts and attention on such uh, a central animal that the naming service was. And that's beneficial to the overall information assurance uh, of the uh, of 4.1 solutions. The next slide. Improved performance uh, is now uh, drilling a little bit uh, concerning the user experience. So as already said, the faster boot times are uh, I expected. Uh, thanks to improvements in the port connection, uh, it should uh, enable faster connection, reducing the way from started boot time. Uh, typically, what you saw before with this push mechanism is one example of those improvements because you're basically dividing by two the number of exchanges because you don't have the requests and the answers for uh, those kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, beyond that, there is an option that enables to have the connections and the linkage to be defined uh, and realized at build time. So if you have a prepackaged uh, applications uh, ready for deployment, this can uh, this will uh, as well reduce the uh, reduce the boot time and the overall boot time. So that's uh, typical of the things that can uh, improve the user experience of uh, SCA uh, of SCA products. 
4.1 products. And uh, concerning the real-time performance as well, uh, this can, uh, we have a number of, uh, so once the waveform is running, we have a number of things that are beneficial. Uh, and this uh, enables a given platform to host uh, more powerful or more demanding uh, applications. And that's, uh, at the end of the day, uh, subject to bring benefits to the end users because they, uh, they may benefit on platforms of uh, applications that would not have been possible to implement using uh, previous technology. Um, big thing for, for that is that it is, uh, let's say, opening the game uh, between the different uh, uh, technology uh, solutions. Uh, Cobra is not mandatory anymore, but it can be chosen. And we know that since the early triple two uh, days, a lot of experience has been gathered uh, in improving and optimizing Cobra uh, per se. And so uh, the question of uh, uh, of real-time performance is not a question core or not. It's a question uh, of uh, what is the best technology and uh, quite good uh, core based technology can exist. But at the same time, uh, what's good with this PIMPISM approach is that it uh, considerably broadens potential adoption for people who, for some reasons, don't have CORBA at hand, are not experienced in that, understand, quite understand what it means to deploy a, uh, uh, an application, uh, quite understand what it means to have their own uh, integration tools, uh, etc., and uh, which could have been frightened in the past uh, in, the, in saying, hey, I need to, uh, to integrate a CORBA solution on my stuff in order to, uh, to be able to propose an SCA solution. It's not the case anymore. So uh, solutions based on uh, any connectivity standards, uh, such as uh, the uh, HemHow connectivity, the MockB, the, the whatsoever, uh, could, be, uh, could be used. And solutions as well uh, with proprietary middleware or connectivity, uh, typically for a very small or emerging processes, could now benefit of what uh, SCA is bringing in terms of the deployment and overall architecture consistency, but without having to go by these uh, uh, forced uh, steps or forced milestone to integrate some sort of, uh, of orb uh, in that. So at the end of the day, it really brings a potential to introduce things and to introduce, sorry, um, uh, SCA and to use 4.1 on a uh, on larger set of, uh, of platforms and, uh, and processes. The Eric, next one. Do you have a question? Yep. Eric, there's a question from Terry Anderson. Uh, it was on your previous slide. Uh, he says the naming service uh, still appears to be in the 4.1 draft. It still appears as a requirement, and he was wondering if you could comment on that. Uh, personally, I may not, because that's a point of the 4.1 draft. I did not uh, did not notice. Maybe we could turn to uh, uh, to Jetnet people uh, who may answer on that or, or, or answer offline. I can I can answer that because it it does appear in the spec, but. If we did things correctly, back in Appendix F, I believe, that uh, requirement shows up as being allocated to the backwards compatible unit of functionality. So it follows that same model of the text disappearing in the, in the body of the spec, but you have to make sure that you correlate that, that main, bad, main body back with the associated uh, uh, unit. Okay. Does that answer your question? I can uh, unmute you if you'd like. Terry, Terry, I've unmuted you. If you wanna, if you wanna ask your question. Oh, he's not on audio. Okay, he uh, he says a resource, a resource factory component shall register with the naming services. Uh, so it's it's written as a shell. Um, so maybe we can uh, take that one offline, and uh, perhaps that's a uh, that's an issue that needs to be. Uh, needs yeah, to be I guess. Yeah, my recommendation is that at this level of specificity, this should be re posted as an issue, uh, uh, in order to be processed according to the process that will be presented in the last part of the webinar. Okay. And Terry um, says okay. <laughs> Great. 
So we, have, we, will, we will have at least one uh, issue, but I'm sure there are already uh, several. Uh, that's normal uh, in the final polishing of such uh, an important spec. So uh, improved performance, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to speed up a little bit because time is running. So uh, this was for the improved performance slide. We can go to the next one. Yeah, reduce development cost. So as to do with two, two main um, benefits. So first, uh, things, have been, uh, things have been done so that uh, static analysis tools, so automated inspection tools, uh, will be um, more easily used, uh, especially to test waveform conformance, but uh, perhaps as well to, uh, to test conformance of a platform components such as devices or services. Uh, so at the end of the day, this enables to find errors, errors much earlier in the development process, and uh, it really saves some uh, pain for uh, a manual inspection time. Uh, and a number of requirements have been tweaked in order to be more directly uh, keeping the same spirit, but to be directly uh, processed using such kind of tools. Uh, and so that's one of the benefits uh, provided by the spec uh, around those lines. The next one is that there's been a, a significant cleanup in requirements. So uh, common requirement tags on the form SEA, blah, 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 has been uh, introduced. And those can be used for both US government or uh, other stakeholders uh, to uh, best use it, uh, let's say, in order to define an accurate uh, conformance uh, strategy. And we could imagine as well some joint international uh, specifications describing uh, how a conformance strategy could be set thanks to these uh, formalized uh, baseline of requirements. Uh, as already said, the number of requirements has been uh, streamlined, so it's not a division by 10, but it has been uh, reduced to the, to the mere minimum. And uh, a number of redundant requirements uh, have been removed, uh, have been removed as well. So this is all going in the, in the good direction. So the next one. Testability improvement, so it has, uh, so still along the same, uh, same, uh, same lines. Uh, so depending on the profiles uh, selected, and thanks to the concept of unit functionalities, uh, there will be uh, the possibility to tailor the tests to what has been uh, actually uh, claimed as uh, conformity points over the different uh, options allowed. And uh, these testability improvements, thanks to the uh, backwards compatibility unit of functionality, so here the picture is out to date because I guess the 4.1 is now adding the backwards compatibility the optional uh, stuff, uh, which was not uh, available uh, at the time we we copied paste this picture here, which is dating from the 4.0. But this backwards compatibility unit of functionality uh, will enable, of course, to benefit from the existing uh, test bases. So at the end of the day, tests and uh, should be uh, should be faster and uh, uh, and easier to tailor to to what is claimed by the products. So the fifth point, oh, no, are we going back? OK, fifth point has to do with improved portability of waveform designs. So uh, the key point, as mentioned, is that uh, there is uh, in the Appendix E, uh, it has been revamped with the introduction of a new stuff, which is the specification of a platform independent modeling ideal profiles for the uh, waveform designs or SDR app designs. Uh, if we want to, to, to broaden uh, things, uh, to be uh, to be developed for those who want uh, who, who, uh, to make uh, better or more portable designs. You have this uh, PIM ideal profiles technology with a full and a ultra lightweight profile that uh, enable to uh, to make the design with independence from the uh, what will be the target. Uh, level uh, chosen technologies. So this can really improve uh, the way uh, designs are done in order to, to improve the portability of the, uh, of the developed components. And uh, in consistent with this PIM, PISM uh, approach, there's been some rationalization of the PISM ideal profiles that are, uh, that are there. 
uh, control is a mistake, it's repism profiles. So you have the ideal corbatism. For those using corba, uh, the mapping is quite straightforward from the uh, PIM ideal profiles, a couple of additions, uh, and, uh, and you have your stuff in order to use a corba-based uh, environment. And there is uh, uh, there are a number of others, uh, other pisms uh, introduced, and clearly that the structure is such that uh, uh, we have a uh, possibility to extend for other PISMs uh, in some future versions of the standard uh, or, uh, or even into some uh, user-defined uh, PISM mappings that could derive from the uh, initial PIM, PIM stuff. So that's quite uh, interesting in the sense that those having done uh, a PIM-focused uh, design uh, will have uh, much less uh, migration issues uh, in case they face uh, a variety of, uh, of PISM choices. Uh, along those lines, uh, we have, uh, and it has to do with uh, expanding the range of places where you can make some portable design to, uh, to constrain environment. Here, especially DSP or type hardly constrained GPPs with this definition of full and neutralized weight POSIX AEPs. And we could quote that around those lines, some international convergence has been achieved. Uh, since we have the uh, same content uh, as uh, the WINF full and neutralized weight PIM IDL profiles, and we have quite similar content uh, compared to the WINF uh, lightweight and ultralightweight POSIX AEP uh, specifications. So uh, we are seeing a convergence, uh, a convergence around those lines with, uh, with stuff that were contributed by uh, international stakeholders. The sixth now, investment protection, so that's the, the, the applause for the backwards compatibility. So as I already said, but it should be hammered. hammered. So uh, 4.1 ensures investments uh, in SCA tribal applications can be reused in a 4.1 environment. Uh, so the domain manager has been reintroduced to obtain the proper allocation properties that are associated to a device. So it allows the application factory to use a device for, for deployment. Uh, so these supports for applications composed uh, of a mixture, oh sorry, uh, along those lines, uh, it as well supports uh, application composed of a mixture of 4.1 and triple 2 components to be, uh, to be deployed and managed. And so this feature, so it's part of the feature that was still on the discussion between the, the, between the, the preview and the draft. So perhaps a little caveat around the, the, uh, the accuracy of what I'm saying here, but the idea behind is clearly to be able to smoothly migrate uh, and adopt some migration path where some could decide to keep a number of their components in triple 2 and progressively uh, uh, upgrade, uh, let's say, them to a pure 4.1 uh, status. Uh, but this capability of application mixture enabled to keep the, um, the application running even if not all of the components have been uh, upgraded to, uh, to, uh, to 4.1. So that's as well uh, potentially highly beneficial in terms of uh, transition roadmap and therefore uh, industrial adoption of the, of the 4.1. Uh, the third point there, and I guess that's the end of my, uh, my presentation, uh, this is uh, as well uh, enabling the, uh, uh, facilitating the ability to migrate, of course, our legacy waveforms to, to, an SCA, uh, to an SCA model. So we're running a little bit uh, short of time, so uh, I'd like to thank you for, for listening to this first part and uh, turn back the, uh, the floor to, to Lee Perker. Thanks, Eric. Uh, now we'll turn it over to Kevin Richardson. Kevin, you ready? I am ready. Okay. Uh, so you might, you might as well go to the next slide, yeah. All right, so um, I'm gonna, I, I think that Eric did a, a much better job explaining what is in the spec than I can do. So in large cases, I, I might just refer to the explanations that he has already provided. And if there are any questions, I will, I will try to address them. So one thing that we think is, is really positive is the fact that now we have that draft out on the street. So uh, it was approved for public release on the 26th of January. So hopefully you've gotten a chance to, to look at it. If not, the 
the intent and the hope is that over the course of the next couple uh, months, you'll have the opportunity to look at it. Uh, one of the the things that is really hard to hard to overstate is that we are are really uh, appreciative of the the work that that WinF and the WinF groups put into developing the the spec and in conjunction with that first part of it being actually out and, and on the street. Now I think we are in a in a great position to have really uh, meaningful conversations just to to ensure that with the materials that were uh, contributed to the the spec that we uh, represented them faithfully within the, the spec and if we did not uh, represent them faithfully within the spec, hopefully people will comment or you know, if there was a reason why that was not retained, we can have that, that discussion. Uh, with the, the last bullet, you'll see that it is our intent that we will have uh, SCA 4.1 finalized in June of, of this year. So next slide, please. So I am going to go in with the assumption that the people that are on the call are familiar with what was in SCA 222 and also familiar with what was in, in 4.0. And the fact that we went to 4.1 does not say that we were unhappy with what was in 4.0. It's just the, the normal progression of trying to, to make the spec and the associated environment better and better. So what we did in 4.1 is that the features that were introduced in, in 4.0, such as the ability to uh, have the reduced boot time, so that fact of introducing uh, push registration, that is something that we definitely wanted to, to keep within the new spec. Being able to introduce that platform independent model to allow the Corva neutral, that is something that we wanted to uh, make sure that we preserved in, in 4.1. So we wanted to take the last spec, build on the good things, and make improvements where we thought they were necessary. Next slide. So something that you'll see, and in, in really relative to, to 4.0, is that there were a few structural changes that now exist within the spec. One of the the things that you'll see is now uh, Appendix B, which is the the AEP, has an attachment. And the reasoning behind that, the attachment contains that detailed mapping of the functions that are allocated to the standard C library. And what we would like people to look at and comment on or think about during this next phase is whether or not that attachment is really valuable or really worthwhile. If the consensus comes back and, and says, eh, because you've laid out the operations that are, are mandatory or not required in the main body of the spec, we don't really need to see them in the standard library. If that's the case, then we'll just kill that attachment as, as part of the transition from draft to final. If it's something that people really uh, want to see preserved, then we will go ahead and make sure that that is represented in the, in the final version. For Appendix E, uh, Eric had, had spoken about the, the PIM model. Uh, what we did, we introduced that new PIM as an Appendix E1 within the spec. We took some of the, the prior materials of the IDL uh, platform independent mapping and we move those just into the base uh, of Appendix E. And then we also uh, revised Appendix E3 to capture a few different languages. And, and if you look closely inside that E3, you'll see that that is somewhat incomplete right now. And that is another area of uh, work that we figure that we can do collectively in terms of if we make that determination whether or not we want to preserve those language-specific mappings, that we can work on finalizing those as a group in terms of the content of how those, those 
uh, elements or those those capabilities or those items should be represented within the spec. Next slide. Uh, just as a just as a reminder, um, these are the the core proposals that came out of out of WinF, and we looked at all except for one of those items, and we integrated aspects of those things within 4.1. For the the one that was not integrated, I will I will capture that and explain what's going on in the subsequent set of slides that we're going to look at and talk about. Next slide. So backwards compatibility. The fact that 4.0 was not backwards compatibility was the, the primary comment that we got when we went out to, to meet with our, our commercial, industrial, international partners. So introducing that uh, feature within the spec was really the one big and the one very important thing that we did. Uh, when we look at how for how backwards compatibility is integrated within the 4.1 spec, the thing that I think is important for people to, to recognize and think about is that the idea of how we envision that being implemented is that the triple two application components are going to be supported within a 4.1 core framework. And it's going to be the fact that that 4.1 core framework is going to provide the ability to manage those triple two compliant uh, application components. So those things will be launched out of a 4.1 core framework. As they are being launched, they will follow all of those requirements and rules that are subject to triple two. But once they get launched, then those things will be managed by a 4.1 framework. They will be connected with 4.1 devices and services, and they will be able to be terminated as part of the end of the end of life aspects of, of management by that 4.1 framework. What is done is that a lot of the details about how that uh, capability is going to be realized are not explicitly laid out in the spec. And definitely we're going to have to give thoughts of how some of that could be done over in the user's guide. But uh, we didn't want to have that subject to requirements that existed within the spec because we thought that would be a little bit uh, too presumptuous in terms of managing, managing a specific implementation. One thing that we are also seeking comments on is that there was a, a little bit of a, a uh, clumsy or creative way to try to capture uh, the backwards compatible requirements. There was one set, and this re responds to, or is another answer to Terry's question, there are some of the backwards compatible requirements that are just associated with the unit of functionality. There are a second set of those requirements that are laid out in sections that are called alternative uh, backwards compatible uh, re requirements. And the intent of those was to try to, to make sure that the requirements that exist within the spec were going to be integrated with the way that the spec was going to be tested or validated. So we were trying to capture that dynamic side of things. So if requirement SCA 44 using one set of language was going to be applicable or to be tested if a 4.1 component was being launched, if that same activity was happening for a triple two component, that's the case where there would be the requirement SCA 44 star. So instead of doing that base 44 requirement, if you were launching a triple two, com a triple two component, you would do 44 star. If there was a requirement 50 that would be applicable if you were launching a 4.1 component, if you didn't have to do that capability for a triple two compliant, triple two uh, compliant component, there would be an SCA 50 star with an NA notation to say 
you don't have to do that requirement if you're launching a triple two. And I don't know how well or poorly that was explained within the, the spec, but that was the intent. So if anyone has any clever ideas of saying, okay, Kevin, I know, I know what y'all were trying to do when you created that structure of the, of the requirements, but you have a better way to do it, we would love to, to hear it, and that could be uh, something that we integrate into the final version. I've already received one suggestion of something that we can do, so uh, that's a dialogue that, that we'll see going forward. Next slide, please. Scalable components. So that is uh, the configurable aspect of, of SCA 4.0, and that is the one thing that we wanted to preserve. So instead of doing things with the optional inheritance or, or uh, conditional inheritance, we move to a, a composition model within the spec. Uh, something that we did, you will notice that there is a requirement or statement within the spec that says, okay, the realization of that composition model is going to need to be through inheritance when you're actually uh, creating, those, uh, creating those interfaces and the associations between those interfaces but we can still model that uh, via a, a UML compliant approach, and that uh, allows us to have a, a standard compliant model and still uh, is a route where we can preserve and go forward with that ability to make an implementation more configurable in terms of just including the appropriate specs or the applicable specs for a target implementation. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, scalable managers, uh, the same as scalable components except for it provides that scalable uh, uh, appearance and that configurable uh, of attributes to the manager component, so a device manager component or a domain manager component, as opposed to, to just a, a basic uh, a basic resource or a basic application uh, component. Uh, something that was included as part of, of that change, actually there were a couple uh, noticeable changes. One, the concept of the 4.0 manager registry was removed. So instead of having two separate registries, one the component registry and the second being the manager registry, that was collapsed into only having a, a component registry. And that's something that I think cleans things up a, an awful lot. The second is that you will notice that we no longer have a device manager interface. There still is a device manager component that exists, but the the interface no longer is needed uh, within the within the structure of the, the core framework. Next slide. Um, for lightweight and the ultra lightweight AAPs, uh, the thing that I think is really important with that capability is that um, when the lightweight AAP was introduced uh, into the into the SCA, it was given a little bit of, of thought, but no one really did a very thorough scrub of the operations that were included within that profile. And what the WINIF working group did when they were looking at both the, the lightweight profile and the ultralightweight profile is that there were a set of of developers present in those meetings that were really intimate with development on those target platforms. And they were, were very thoughtful of identifying a set of, of operations that were very applicable for each of those platforms. Uh, what we tried to do as part of the, the specification is to really try to create some space between the full profile, the lightweight profile, and the ultralight weight profile. So that ultra lightweight profile, the objective was to make that thing as small as possible. So if you read the, the WinF spec, they have a base profile 
and we wanted to try to align ultra lightweight with that base profile of that minimum set of, of uh, operations that were applicable for that platform. For the lightweight profile, we thought, okay, that's going to be the thing that exists in that center space. So it's not the smallest equivalent to the ultra lightweight, uh, but we wanted to come up with a a set of operations that met the needs of people who were going to be doing work or, or development organizations that were going to be doing work in that environment. Also, we had an eye on convergence with other standard communities. So when we came up with that final set of, of operations, we took the base profile and then we took the operations that existed within the Group A and Group B proposals. And to see what Group A and Group B means, you have to go back and look at the WinF spec. But we took the Group A and Group A items that were also present within uh, a profile. Uh, I think it was the safety-based profile that exists within the FACE spec. And the FACE spec is, that, is another uh, profile that exists within the DOD Airborne community. But we have this longer term vision of making sure that SCA, WinF, and, and FACE are all playing within the, within the same space. Um, largely, we wanted to make sure that we preserved all of those operations that were recommended by WinF because, again, a lot of work was done when that uh, spec uh, was developed. There is one issue related to priority inversions, and that was something that was created by my misinterpretation of something. So uh, we've sent out, a, or I've sent out a few emails to different people, and we're in the process of already working that issue going forward. Next slide. I'm still not advancing here. Thank you. Um, so similar to AAP, IDL was another specification that was developed by the, the WinF group. And uh, when we looked at that, uh, we wanted to incorporate that within the, the SCA body because it's something that did not exist. And it's something that uh, in the long run is going to improve portability for our applications. And it's a different flavor of portability. So it's it's uh, portability going between different target operating platform families. So following those, establishing and then following those guidelines is something that will enable uh, people to better go from, say, a, a GPP to a DSP environment or, or something that is just sort of uh, follows a different way of, of uh, a different way of porting. Um, there was one issue uh, between the way that we interpreted things and, and things that were presented in the, the WinF specification, and that was related to type any. And type any has been the bane of our existence uh, for quite a while in SCA land. Uh, we pushed to have any included within the, the full profile. And that is a, an issue that was taken back to uh, to WinF, and it went through their process. I do not recall whether or not the updated version of that spec has been posted out on the WinF site or not, but it's a, it's a case where we've actually exercised the, the model and, and seen results coming back on, on both sides to make sure that we stay in sync. Next slide. Uh, just so you know, the uh, revised spec was posted yesterday. Oh, okay. Excellent. Thanks. Um, naming conventions, another, an unsolicited uh, contribution that came out of the, the WinF group was to, to go back and, and look, at the, look at the names which are used and, and change those where it was appropriate. And something that we've seen uh, just in looking at the 4.1 uh, spec is that where we did change the names, it actually ends up being a, a, a very a very nice feature, and it is something that I think 
uh, improves that, that readability. We didn't quite follow the, uh, the recommendations that came out of the WINF group to the, the letter. Um, there was a much more uh, involved a uh, set of recommendations about a naming convention that we got from there, and we decide we opted against not going all the way down that path because it was going to have more of an impact on the the existing ass assets which had been developed and put in the information repository. So we just came up with a a higher level higher level naming convention of just saying <clears throat> any that used to have component in the name, we wanted to get rid of those. Also. If there were uh, old names that had object in the name, so we had loadable object and, and testable object before, we got that object out of the out of the name as well. Uh, we liked the guidelines that were provided, and if we have instances where uh, new interfaces are going to be introduced in the, the future, we'll try to follow those. But we just we weren't quite as strict with those. Next slide. Similarly, uh, we renamed some of the, the component names as well. And we were much more open to changing uh, component names because components were a feature that was introduced as part of, of SCA4. And since SCA4 was not widely, widely implemented, uh, we had a little bit more latitude to, to go and make those changes because there was not that, that pre-existing base that we were going to be impacting. Next slide. The, there were some changes that were made to device push registration. If we go back to 4.0, push model registration was something that was only rolled out for application components. And within 4.1, as we use this feature, uh, it extends push registration to not only be uh, applicable for uh, application components, but it's uh, applicable or usable by, by device components as well. And there was a an additional benefit that came out of the design approach, which was provided by, by WINF, in that the way that this was modeled and realized is that now this push registration approach also provides a solution or more detail in terms of how late registration can be achieved within the bounds of the 4.1 spec. So it was implemented by going to that component struct that was introduced as, as part of, of 4.0. Those strike through lines were uh, items that WINF proposed that in the end we decided not to keep. The specialized info field, that is going to be our evolution mechanism uh, or our extension mechanism going forward. So if there is special information, say, for a, a manager component, that is something that can be introduced uh, within the specialized info. If there is additional information that need to be, needs to be provided for devices, such as the allocation properties, that is something that can be introduced uh, within that specialized info field. Next slide. That just shows some of those specializations. So um, the one on top is the, the way that that specialized info field can be extended in order to represent uh, allocation components. Next slide. Application mixture. So I said that there was all but all but one of the, the items that we introduced within the spec. Application mixture is the one WINF proposal that we did not uh, integrate within the 4.1 draft. And there were a couple reasons for that. One, there was a, uh, a time item that, that crept in, and we really didn't come to closure in terms of how we felt that application mixture should be represented within the spec. The second is that uh, application mixture, there's an aspect of it that really depends on us having a good,
common understanding of how we wanted backwards compatibility as a whole to be represented. So I think having this time to, A, have the brief discussion amongst our group to make sure that we have backwards compatibility uh, implemented correctly within the spec will provide the necessary baseline for us to, to build application mixture. Uh, and this is one of those areas that shortly after this meeting, we want to, to try to set up uh, a few combined meetings between the, the JITNIC standards working group and any people from the WINF working groups that would like to participate to actually talk about application mixture and how we feel like it could be or should be integrated within the spec. Next slide. Um, so that is sort of the quick tour of 4.1 and how it was actually realized. It builds on Eric's overview of the 4.1 spec. Um, again, just like to reiterate that our, our target is to have 4.1 finalized in June. So we have this nice window for people to read the spec, to comment on the spec, and hopefully to to try to do a little bit of prototyping just to make sure that all of the things that are are represented uh, in 4.1 work. Um, and any comments that you have on that or suggestions that you have would be very much appreciated and we will we will uh, work through those uh, as a group, hopefully. And the second aspect of the path forward is to get SCA 4.1 into the DOD standardization pipeline by late this calendar year. And something that some of you may realize or may not uh, realize is that uh, JITNIC standards had a big push in 2014 to get SCA 222 introduced within the DOD uh, standards uh, pipeline. So it is there. SCA 222 exists within the DISR. And our plan is once we finalize 4.1, we're going to initiate those activities to get it introduced as well. So next slide. And then we are, are not going to sit still with 4.1. Uh, there are a lot of other interesting topics and areas that we would like to discuss across the, the different communities just to see if they are things that are worthy of being introduced into the, the SCA standardization pipeline. So uh, no plans for saying, OK, on, on July 15th, there's going to be SCA next next or SCA 4.2. But we are actively going out and looking at those features and seeing if there are any things that the community at large really thinks should be incorporated within the spec. And that's our, this is our starting list of, of items. So if you, again, if you have any suggestions, just send that to the group. Next slide. Uh, Kevin, before we go to the next slide, there was a question on your previous slide. Um, how accessible is DISSER to the international community? Um, only? I do not think that the DISSER is accessible, because I know every, every time that I have tried to, to access the DISR, I know there is a, a additional set of uh, DOD uh, credentials that are, are needed to go and access that list of items. What I can do is I will see if there is a more complete answer to that question, and I will send that to you, Lee, when I find an answer. OK, great. And. That's it. Are there any additional questions? If so, uh, please type them in your questions window. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, Ken, you ready to go? Yes, I am. <clears throat> Just hoping my voice holds up. Okay, so um, this part of the webinar is going to focus on the process and the procedure 
through which issues can be submitted via the Wireless Innovation Forum, um, issues against the SCA 4.1 draft, how they'll be handled within the forum, and then the subsequent output and resulting work products um, that are delivered out of the forum based on that. So, next slide. So at a very high level, um, just some guiding principles here. Um, through the Wireless Innovation Forum, um, submitting comments against the draft, we have put up a, an issues um, reporting form, and this can be used for any number of specifications, all the different specifications that the forum has created. Um, and we're using the same mechanism that has been in place, and we're using that for the 4.1 draft comments. So that will be coming in through a standard form. Um, when they're received, they will be forwarded into a working group that has been put together within the Wireless Innovation Forum, specifically, specifically for the purpose of handling and adjudicating comments on the SCA 4.1 draft. Um, this group isn't going to be working in a vacuum, the JTNC. Um, has been a very close partner uh, with the forum in the development of the forum specifications and recommended changes to 4.1, um, and they'll continue to participate through the adjudication of the comments um, at SMEs, um, subject matter experts, uh, through the work group, and um, also you know, via the blog structure that is being put in place. Um, and I don't think Kevin mentioned this before, but as at this point, we're expecting the comment period to close on March 20th. So that will be the last date that we will be accepting comments on the 4.1 draft specifications. Next. Okay, so I just wanted to go a little bit through the workflow on how the adjudication process is going to work. Um, the blue, um, <coughs> blue objects that are in there, that's really work that happens within the wireless innovation form with either either within the work group or through the approval process. And then the red brownish colored areas are all things that happen outside of the forum, either as inputs to the forum or collaboration um, with the JTNC or the public in general. Um, so basically this starts with an issue that is generated by somebody in the user community and they submit this in via the um, the form. And I will be going through the, what this form looks like um, later in this, in this presentation. Um, so the issue is brought in and it's processed um, by the Wireless Innovation Forum within the work group. Now as soon as it's brought in, um, it'll be posted to the blog. And via that blog, um, we'll be able to get feedback from the general user community and also specifically from the JTNC. So that's going to be really our primary mechanism on communications with the external world um, as we go through the adjudication process on each of the comments that are that are submitted um, into the forum. Um, so based on the inputs from the blog and the internal um, deliberations within the working group, a recommendation will be developed by the working group. Um, and that goes through our standard internal working group processes. Um, so it's a normal project um, that's set up and, and we'll just handle that. Um, the next flow from there after the working group um, has developed the recommendations and finalized that is that the recommendations go through the normal wireless innovation forum approval process. So this is not handled on an issue by issue basis. This will be the accumulation of all of the different issues turned into a, a, a set of work products or one singular work product. Um, with either markups to the specification itself or recommendations to markup, recommendations on changes to the specification. Um, so that will go through the normal forum approval process and when finally approved by the forum, um, that will be delivered to the JTNC, um, ICWG, ICWIC, or Standards Working Group as Kevin has been referencing it. And they will take those and really the final step then is um, they will deliberate on those recommendations and hopefully since they've been involved in the process really from start to finish, um, they will take those um, and use those directly and do an update to the 4.1 specification and have that delivered as per the timeline that Kevin talked about. So that's a kind of high level overview workflow of how that happens. Um, go on to the next slide. Uh, before you go, there's a question that was submitted um, are there any issues that have already been received against the SCA 4.1 draft? 
And if so, how many? Yes, there have been issues that have been submitted against it already. Um, I think the count is five or six. And they're all available on the blog. And I will actually be doing a demo of the form and the blog. So when we get to the blog, you'll actually be able to see um, each of those issues that have already been submitted. Um, but certainly, you can go to the Wireless Innovation Forum homepage at any time and, and um, go directly to that blog to see what those issues are. OK, so kind of detail step by step going through the process here. Um, as I mentioned, all the issues submitted are going to be submitted via the issue um, reporting form. That's, that's on the Wireless Innovation homepage. Um, we put a nice, easy to get to button right on the homepage. Um, so that'll facilitate uh, making that easy. Um, so every commit, every issue that has been submitted will go through a very immediate kind of triage um, activity. And one, we're going to very quickly determine whether this is a relevant comment to the specification or whether it's one that's not really relevant to the specification. And there, there are times where we'll get a comment that are more procedural on how the forum might, for instance, might be doing something in the handling, and it's not really a comment on the specification. So that we would reject as a comment to the specification. Um, we keep it in other, other forms, for you know, other forums, for instance, but um, would not be a, an accepted comment on the specification. Um, but for all comments that are accepted, um, they will all be posted to the blog, and that makes them available for review by the by the user community, so that anybody can see the issues that have been submitted against the 4.1 specification and and um, provide their viewpoints and inputs and comments um, on this issue that's been submitted. Um, the work group, um, when it is posted to the blog, it's also forwarded to the work group. And then the work group goes through its process of handling that specific issue. So obviously, a review of the issue, a review of the specification, and a discussion on you know what is going to be the recommended solution to this um, issue that's been reported um, will happen within the work group. And the work group will refer back to the blog for inputs um, and any other you know, information that has been forwarded via the blog. And as each of the issues goes through its, its um, path and gets towards a recommendation, the recommended um, proposal or recommended fix for that issue will get posted back to the blog also. So um, everything, all working activities and end resulting activities um, we'll get posted back and back onto the blog and be available um, for the user community to see those. Next slide. Okay, so um, all comments will end up being reflected in the final work product um, or work products that are generated from the working group. So whether it was rejected or accepted, um, it will be included in the final work product. So it'll be a complete uh, accounting of all issues that are that have been submitted, um, whether they were accepted as a legitimate comment against the specification or not. Um, and when all of these um, work products, when the work products are finalized, it will go through the, as I mentioned before, the standard wireless the forum approval process. You know, let's say work group balloting, a committee balloting, and then a final um, forum membership balloting. So it goes through each of those balloting stages. And um, when all of those are completed, that is, at that point, considered a wireless innovation forum um, recommendation, either a document or a specification. In this case, it won't be a specification, unlikely. Um, be an update to uh, maybe a forum specification or recommendations to changes to the SCA 4.1 draft. <coughs> and when the final validated um, work product is completed to be forwarded to the JTNC so that they can use that for consideration um, to the to their updates to the 4.1. So it's really it's not the forum that makes the final updates to the 4.1. Um, we're developing the recommendations to be considered by the JTNC and the JTNC then takes those um, recommendations and applies them to the 4.1 specification. <coughs> okay, next. Okay, hey, so Lee, can you pass some um, control over to me? Sure thing.
well, maybe I can. <laughs> this, this went real smoothly last week. Do you want me to go ahead and try to do it? Yes, please, Stephanie. Okay. It's not letting me switch. All right, you have it, Ken? Yes. So can everybody see the um, I'm presenting the wireless innovation homepage? Is that what is being shown? Yes. Okay, it was either that or a nice picture of Alaska. I didn't, didn't know what you were going to see. So on the uh, on the home page of the Wireless Innovation Forum, um, there's a most prominent feature really right in the middle of the page is the is where to submit an issue on the 4.1 draft um, standard. So all you need to do very simply is click on the submit an issue button, and the form comes up for submitting an issue. And you scroll down to get to the <clears throat> interesting part of that. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a standard form. So this was not created specifically for the 4.1 issue handling. So what you can see there, um, these bullets right in the middle, is, OK, this basically is everything that um, the forum will accept comments on and issues on. And the very top item listed is the 4.1 draft. The next three items listed are forum, actually next four items listed are forum specifications that have been developed over time. So this same form would be used to develop, I mean to submit issues against all of those previously developed um, work products and specifications that have been that have been created by the forum. And you know, the two that are most interesting to this are the IDL profiles and the lightweight and ultra -late, lightweight AEPs. So those were the inputs that went into 4.1. Um, so that was the you know, that was where they, um, those inputs came from. But don't submit comments on those, even if your comments are against the IDL profiles portion or the AEPs. Be sure to submit comments against the 4.1 draft. And I'll show you how to do that in just a second. So most of the information that's on this form is required. So you must enter a contact name and what organization you represent and your email address. Um, that goes into the top section. Um, next, select the document that you're commenting on. <clears throat> so it defaults to the 4.1 draft, so you won't have to do anything. But just for completeness, you can see it's pulled down with all of the other documents that are listed. So you leave that on 4.1. Um, get into the specifics on the actual page and section and paragraph identifiers that the issue that you're submitting um, is against. If it's you know something that's against across multiple sections, you know, you can use the word variable or various or numerous or anything like that. Um, maybe list the first one so we can zero in on very quickly. Um, maybe the first section and paragraph where that occurs and then for page, say numerous. Um, the next item is one line description. So this is kind of think of it as the title. So just an easy way for it to be referenced um, and, and be talked about and identify what this issue is about. Next is a up to 1,000 character um, full description. So free format, enter any information that you need to, um, to describe the issue that you have. Um, it is possible, you know, well, it's not possible through the form to, to, um, attach, to attach an attachment. So if you want to send an attachment, you would send that directly to Lee. And in this form, indicate that, indicate that there's a comment or an attachment um, that has been sent to Lee that is corresponding to this issue. So that is how attachments are handled. Um, in, identify a severity of it, critical, major, minor. Um, if you wish, you may enter a proposed resolution. So again, up to 1,000 characters. Um, so rather than just pointing out an issue, if you have thoughts on how this issue should be uh, resolved, um, feel free to enter that. We welcome all the input and assistance um, that you're willing to give us. It makes our jobs easier. And the last part of the form are some kind of um, acknowledgments that you're not disclosing any intellectual property or any um, anything with patents, in, patents or infringements or anything of that nature. So we can't accept anything like that. And you also have to acknowledge that you're 
not disclosing any export or controlled information in completing the form. So those two um, forms or for, for those two items need to be completed and, and selected, and then you just hit the submit button. So it's a really straightforward form, um, very easy to use. So then after you hit the submit button, and it is delivered into the forum, and within a day it will be posted to the blog if it has been accepted. And to get to the blog, you use the join the conversation and view issues currently being adjudicated here. Um, not exactly a button, sentence. So that brings you to this page, which is our blog page that has been set up specifically for handling the 4.1 um, issues adjudication. And it talks about the process that is there, largely what I talked about previously. Um, and then you can see a list of all the different issues that have been submitted. So as you can see, and I mentioned before, we have a, a number of issues that have been submitted already. Um, so I'm not going to go through these. I'm just showing these for as an example. I am going to scroll um, to the next page. And then you go down to um, issue 101, which is actually called typos. And just the um, you know, interesting thing about that is here's the description of it. And I thought that's one where we had a comment on it. Yeah, you have to click on the issue itself. Oh, I have to click on it. Okay, I've done that earlier. I missed it. Yeah. And so you would enter your comment, you add a comment, and then to see any other type of, or any other comments that have been supplied, click on the issue, and it brings up any any other comments that have been provided in the blog relative to that issue. So it's a very straightforward, easy to use interface, um, and it really does make this a, a very open. Um, open process and available to everybody to participate who is interested in participating. So that is a very quick walkthrough of the forum and the blog, um, but they are simple to use, so probably was sufficient. So Lee, if you want to take control back, or Stephanie, give it back to Lee. Lee, can you get it, or do I need to switch it to you? I'll try. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you may have to switch it to me. All right. Well, they have there are four, well, three other than myself listed as organizers. I'm not sure which one is you. Hold on. Yep, I've got it. Thank you. Okay, and just I had put um, within the presentation, I had just copied um, the form in there and just put some comments as to the you know, use of it. Um, but it really it's just reflective of what we went through um, online and live. And okay. That completes what I had. So that's the uh, last of the slides. Uh, I guess at this point we've got about 10 minutes left in the webinar, so why don't we open it up for questions. Um, so one question was submitted by Terry Anderson. And the question was, why can one not see who submitted a comment? The author of the comment? <coughs> Does he mean? <coughs> um, you want me to answer that one? Sure. Uh, so the discussions that we had were that um, some of the people who were submitting the comments, even though we know who they are, uh, some of the folks who are submitting the comments um, may want to be anonymous for one reason or another. So what we did is tried to keep it, uh, tried to keep it, uh, the name suppressed that way. Um, we can always revisit that if that's something that people feel is, is important to the, to the process. Terry, does that answer your question? So it's okay. Are there other questions? Give folks a, a, a second or two to type.
Okay, well, I'm not seeing any other questions. So uh, thanks again for everybody for your attention. Uh, thanks to Eric, Kevin, and Ken for doing the presentation. Um, again, we'll post the slides later today on the forum's web website. Go to wirelessinnovation.org slash webinars. Uh, oh, um, we did get one last question in. Uh, the question is, please elaborate on the international nature of SCA 4.1. Kevin, Ken, Eric, one of you want to take that one? Um, I'll, I'll start with it, and then Kevin and, and Eric can join in. Um, and I think that's one of the real strengths of 4.1 actually is the amount of international collaboration that went into the development of it. Um, there has been a lot of, you know, through programs such as SOAR, um, may have utilized triple two and made some extensions to it within their own program. And a lot of the feedback from the SOAR program um, went into the development of some of the 4.1 um, changes that were in there. So from the international perspective, um, there was a lot of a lot of the international input um, can be seen in, in what has gone into the changes that are in 4.1. Eric, you want to? Yeah, I, I, Kevin? I was, I was just going to say I can't really add too much more uh, beyond that point, just the, the fact that there were significant uh, modifications that were proposed. Uh, by the international community that were incorporated within the spec and just with the direction that we have been given within our, our standards working group, we would we have the intent to continue working with all parties to to make revisions and, and changes and to to the spec and to try to tune the four dot one draft going towards the final. So we want to we want to participate as, as open as we can. Yeah. And that's one of the <laughs> Is that me? Uh try again, Ken. So that that's one of the benefits of um using an organization like the Wireless Innovation Forum for the development of the inputs to the to the 4.1 specification. Is the forum is an international organization open to members from all throughout the world. And this provides a really good platform uh, for bringing in those perspectives from all around the world um, when making updates to something like 4.1 or for any of the other uh, specifications that, that are developed within the forum is it almost inherently brings an international um, view and point of view um, into the specification creation. Can you hear me, Eric speaking? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just to elaborate on those lines, uh, it, it was quite, seen from a uh, European perspective typically, uh, it was uh, quite productive a model and uh, a number of things that were introduced I would say what has to do with the, the portability things and the right rate, the ultra right rate kind of stuff was really a blend uh, of uh, things that came in from uh, a sort typically or a European plus uh, uh, background gathered but not yet materialized uh, within the, uh, the SCA uh, on the uh, US side. And this kind of blend was uh, reasonably successful or quite successful, I would say. Uh, in having the WinF specs first and then the way, uh, the degree to which they have been uh, reused uh, into the 4.1 uh, proves that we were near to the target in making the job at, uh, at, uh, at the WinF. Uh, only a couple of minor things were, are remaining to be twisted in order to uh, to have 100 percent alignment. We are at 99.5, I would say. But globally this was quite uh, successful, I would say. And we could mention as well, as far as international is concerned, that uh, the backwards compatibility group had uh, quite a 
cost of involvement from um, from Nordia Soft from Canada. So is it international? Well, I don't know, uh, but uh, strictly speaking, yes, uh, compared to the uh, the US only basis. So all that makes the a number of things brought in the 4.1 uh, success, uh, successful successful blend, I would say, between uh, between a US background and and international insights. So a little bit of follow-up uh, on the question. We it was requested that if we could incorporate into these slides um, some of the responses that were just made on the international nature of the spec. So maybe that's something for us to follow up on offline. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thanks again to Eric, Kevin, and Ken for their uh, for their presentations. Uh, thanks to everyone for uh, for your attention. We really appreciate it. And as I said, the slides will be posted later today, and the um, uh, webinar should be the recorded version of the webinar should be available online, also uh, later today or early tomorrow. Um, with that, I'll close. And um, if you have any need any additional uh, help or have any additional questions, feel free to contact me uh, via email. Thank you, everyone, and have a good day.